Wednesday, October 30th, and this is Markets Daily, hosted by me, Jen Sanasi. On this show, we navigate the currents shaping the crypto market, so whether you're actively investing or just watching the volatility that is the crypto markets, this show is your compass to where we were, where we are, and where we are going. Good day, everybody. We are talking all about Bitcoin today. It has been in the headlines lately as the largest cryptocurrency by market cap came very, very close to its all-time high. Bitcoin passed $73,000 on Tuesday, meaning that 99.7% of the circulating supply was in profit. That said, investors have been taking profit, as you should, and analysts are closely watching some big bags to determine what could happen next. The government of Bhutan has $900 million worth of Bitcoin and recently moved a chunk of it to an exchange, signaling that they too might be looking to capitalize on the high prices. This move could weigh on the market. As market watchers, we are watching a lot heading into November, including what whales like the government of Bhutan are doing and the upcoming U.S. election, which is just days away. Now, I think the narrative around price action has been covered pretty extensively in the news. So on today's show, we're going to do something a little bit different, and we're going to take a look at the tech. Because as an investor, you should understand the developments that are taking place on the Bitcoin blockchain and the value that that brings brings to the asset. Here's Coindesk's tech and protocols editor Brad Cowan in conversation with Stack CEO Maniba Ali unpacking Stack's recent Nakamoto upgrade. All right. Well, we're here with uh, Muni Bali, uh, the uh, co-founder of Stacks and uh, the leader of the super interesting uh, Bitcoin Layer 2 project, one of the original Bitcoin Layer 2 projects. And uh and uh, Stacks has just today completed its uh, or activated its its uh, much awaited a huge uh, part of their roadmap the uh, the Nakamoto upgrade as of block eight sixty seven eight sixty seven. What's the significance of significance of that, Munib? Uh, so I think uh, block eight six seven eight six seven become important when uh, the court has picked it for activation and you know there's a small window of blocks you could pick there uh, just based on how the stacks uh, l2 works is basically it had to be soon enough because everyone's waiting you can't push it back too much it had to be after a reward cycle window so stacks has the system where every two weeks people are, are earning bitcoin rewards so right after the reward cycle recycles is when we want to do it, but not too far away. We didn't want it to be in November, we wanted it to be in October. So the stars aligned. Um, uh, it was the week of the original Bitcoin white paper being released, uh, Halloween and still in October okay. and at the, the boundary of the reward cycle that we wanted to be in. So then the, there's a question of picking the what number. So eight, 867 adds up to be 21. 21 million BTC. So we went with okay. 867. <laughs> Clever. All right. Well, you know, one thing that I would love to ask you about, Munib, uh, I, you you told me just a couple seconds ago before we started uh, that you're in Italy and, you know, doing a, pro, a, a giant upgrade of a project of this size with all these security considerations and something you've been working on for years. Um, how do you manage that with kind of a, a, a remote global team or, or kind of what did that look like from your perspective? Yeah, no, I, I think that's a great question. So yeah, I'm in Italy, I'm here for some work and I, it, they, so I would say it's both the interesting part and the hard part, right? Like, because the ecosystem is so decentralized, there are so many independent entities, independent sort of like, you know, open source developers who contribute. So the hard part is. Because it's not a company, it's such a decentralized ecosystem, it's very hard to direct those people and get them together because they don't work for you. Like you can't just fire them if they're not doing their job. They're doing it out of passion or they're doing it uh, because their entity has a business interest in working on uh, the open source software, right? So they report to different managers and, and so on. So it makes it hard, but then the good part is there's also no single point of failure. There's no single team that's going to sort of like, you know, fall apart and it's not going to happen. So the, how that leads into the launches that I was actually in, in, in Italy, a different time zone, most of them try to uh, synchronize around the New York time. And in New York, 
people were up. So they had a war room chat, right? Like I think it was a Zoom call and there are okay. 30, 40 core developers in various capacities uh, who were go in and out of the war, <laughs> war room where everyone's, everyone's watching the launch. And I actually went to sleep because it's pretty late there. <laughs> so these and when you said watching up. the launch, what specifically were they watching? So they are watching all the miners and the signers. So everybody upgraded to the new software. And I think we had some, we had a dashboard where it showed like maybe 97% of the signing power was upgraded to the latest software, which is the, the binary that the, the core devs released. So that looked healthy, right? Like most, almost everyone who matters has actually upgraded to the new software. Everyone is watching for the blog, but any issues coming up, you know, someone reporting like what's going on, people will go debug, try to see. It's a tense time. These people have been working on it for more than 1.5 years, right? So it's a tense time. Uh, it is a little bit ahead uh, in the time zone. So I actually went to sleep and the blog passed. I woke up to messages of like, congratulations, like my my... My messages are blowing up. I went to Twitter. It's blowing up. I was like, wait a minute. Did I actually just miss the blog? I actually did. And, but I was able to catch the war room because some people were still awake. And I went in and there were a lot of like celebrations and everyone's excited. And I, I, I got to like hang out with them for a little bit. So that's my story. I actually, okay, I actually missed that's the blog. Amazing. <laughs> and were there, have there been any hiccups or glitches so far? Or does it look like it's pretty smooth or... No, I think it's it's as smooth as we could have hoped for, really. Okay. And I think it's really a testament to how much testing went into the launch. Even the so there was the first part that happened around Bitcoin halving, and over there it was like one point one billion dollars of capital was unlocking for the old system and locking into the new system. It's a little bit like how when ETH did their upgrade and people were locking capital into the new consensus, not at the same scale. ETH is a, a little bit bigger, but still a billion dollars getting unlocked and locked into the new system. That was, that's a part one that happened around Bitcoin halving. But part two was much bigger. All the new rules are going live. And I think it's it's a testament to all the testing and the work we did. Sometimes, you know, the community members are like, hey, it's taking longer than expected. Why, why is there a delay of like two weeks, this and that? Well, that's the reason. You want to you wanna optimize for safety. You want to optimize for testing so that when the actual real show happens, it, it goes smoothly. Okay, this part's going to be easy, which is just, you know, real quick, like, you know, summary version of what is the Nakamoto upgrade? What is it? What does it do relative to what you had previously? Yes. So I think, uh, think of this as it's a massive upgrade to Bitcoin UX in a way, because Bitcoin has blocks between 10 to 40 minutes time. And this is how stacks used to work. It would produce a block every time Bitcoin produces a block. And now we have sort of like decoupled the L2 blocks from the L1 blocks. And you can have much faster, a couple of seconds, like five seconds, whatever blocks. Uh, and people can get their confirmations much faster. So people who have been users of stacks, they're now having almost like a magical time. They're like, oh, wow, I just sent a transaction. And within a couple of seconds, it gets confirmed. It's also very reliable and in the sense that, you know, you don't know if you're waiting for a Bitcoin block for an hour or five minutes. You don't know, right? Whereas now, if a Bitcoin block takes like an hour, you can have consistent blocks on the L2. And as soon as a Bitcoin block comes, everything gets confirmed um, at the Bitcoin level and follows Bitcoin finality, which is the next big thing. So Stack sort of like upgraded its security to be backed by 100% of Bitcoin hash power which is really interesting, right? Like we look at Bitcoin as an amazing resource, more than a trillion dollars in capital, but it's also an insane amount of hash power. So as a Bitcoin L2, we're able to tap into that hash power and have 100% Bitcoin finality. Which, what that means is if you do a transaction on, on Saks now, as soon as a Bitcoin block comes and someone wants to reverse that transaction or reorder it or mess with it in any way, they will have to go attack Bitcoin miners. Which is, which is a very strong security feature that you have. Any application you're running on Stacks moving forward after this upgrade is backed by Bitcoin security. And last but not least, it sets us up for the release of SBDC, which is our L2 BTC asset. Uh, that's expected in the next four to six weeks. And once you know all these foundations and faster UX is in place, now we can start moving BTC from L1 to L2 and start using it on these faster, cheaper rails.
Hey everyone, did you know 52 million Americans own cryptocurrencies? That's not just a number, it's a movement, economic, social, and political. Decentralized finance, blockchain, and digital currencies are more than buzzwords, they are the future. This November, it's on us to show up and step up. We need to protect crypto to ensure it continues to fuel innovation and freedom for our families and businesses. Don't let this opportunity slip by. The future of crypto is on the line. Make your voice heard this November and pledge to vote now at standwithcrypto.org backslash pledge. And, and Munib, I mean, you, you and I talked uh, actually here at Consensus, a little plug um, back in, in May here in Austin. And, uh, I spoke at a, it was actually a rootstock, uh, side event and you were on the panel with, uh, rootstocks, uh, president, but you know, there's been this explosion in Bitcoin L2 projects and with varying levels of sort of technology. Um, and I'm curious, you know, where do you, where would you rate yourself among, from a technological perspective, right? you know, where would you kind of rank yourself uh, versus all these other projects? So I think, I think in terms of things that are live right now, I would rank Stacks as um, a, a L2 that's actually very deeply integrated with Bitcoin L1. It follows okay. Bitcoin finality, all the software, like even, you know, we were waiting for a Bitcoin block for our upgrade to go live. Because everything in Stacks is like so deeply integrated with Bitcoin. Bitcoin is sort of like the master and Stacks sort of like follows everything that Bitcoin is doing, reads all the transactions, is very, very tightly integrated. So that, that's one thing. Whereas, you know, there are some projects without taking any names, they're really like an Ethereum L2 building like in Ethereum land. And just because they have a Bitcoin asset, they're trying to call themselves like a, like a Bitcoin L2. Whereas this is very, very different. It has Bitcoin security. It, uh, you can do BTC transactions to interact with Stacks smart contracts. So many details of like how tightly integrated Stacks is to Bitcoin. That's one thing. Then I would say that there are some projects that are more future looking, right? Who are looking at rollups or who are looking at new capabilities that Bitcoin might have in the future. And the way to differentiate Stacks from, from those projects, which is another category of new crop of projects, is that we're very pragmatic. We are focused on what's possible today, meaning in 2024, in 2025. We are doing R&D work on some of these more futuristic approaches like you know, BitVM or uh, that reduces like the trust assumptions or yeah. rollups. Yeah, and I mean, we just wrote about um, Bob uh, and their paper they put out uh, centered yeah. around Or BitVM2, yeah, they, they yeah. wrote a paper about BitVM2. But I think we are very much focused on what's the pragmatic thing that can be live today, that's secure enough, that's decentralized enough, that users can start using today and get a taste of like what Bitcoin DeFi is going to look like. And as these R&D approaches mature, I think we have a roadmap for how to integrate them and take them live. So I think that's another way to differentiate that instead of waiting for like, hey, Bitcoin to have an upgrade or some R&D technology to mature enough, we want to push forward, we want to go live, we want to give users a great UX and then upgrade things as, as they become mature enough. And Muneeb, what do you want to see happen next? You know, and maybe I, I guess I'm talking more about the business end of things. You know, what is the, what does success look like? What are the metrics? You know, where are the people? You know, where's the money? Like, what would you want to see to where you were like, okay, this was worth it? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the fast blocks went live, Bitcoin, uh, you know, security went live, but a lot of like smaller startups or teams were building on top. I think there were, there were a lot of teams who were sort of like waiting for Nakamoto before doing their launches. So I wouldn't be surprised if in the coming weeks, we're seeing a lot of like new startups and applications launch, uh, people want to go live. And I think especially in the next like month or month or, or two months, um, the, the next big thing is actually SBDC, which is our Bitcoin asset and decentralized way of bringing BDC. And I think there's going to be a lot of momentum, a lot of excitement building towards that launch because that SBDC needed Nakamoto to be live. Now this is live. So I think in the coming weeks, we're going to see, you know, new sort of like applications launching, but really leading up to SBDC. And in terms of metrics, I think the biggest metric that really matters is the amount of Bitcoin deployed in the L2. 
So okay. the way to think about it, this yeah. is that, uh, okay, Bitcoin is, is almost like a store of value and something you just keep in cold storage on the L1. But if you want to actively deploy it, if you want to actively use it, if you want to deploy it to earn yields, uh, if you want to program it, you're going to move it into the L2. And that would, that would mean, you know, more SPTC uh, deployed into the, the L2. And I think that's a metric that we'd be watching uh, after the launch of SPTC. Uh, okay, Muneeb, I got a, a question that was passed to me by uh, our producer, Mel, or, or our booker, Mel Montanez. Uh, she, she said, you have said in the past that you see a $70 billion market for Bitcoin DeFi. Is that a current number? And, and where does that number come from? And how does it happen? I think I think the number is probably even higher. It's probably like hundred billion or more. And uh, the my calculation is, if you look at Ethereum, uh, Ethereum is around three hundred billion, four hundred billion market cap. Depends on where they're trading, but around thirty five percent of ETH is actively deployed. Yeah. So on Bitcoin, even if ten percent of Bitcoin gets actively deployed, that's more than a hundred billion market. Right. And, and, and it's going to get actively deployed only through L2s. There's no sort of like, you know, functionality on the Bitcoin L1 to do right. it. Another way to measure it is Ethereum L2s are already 70, 80 billion market. So like, you know, Arbitrum, Optimism, all these different things. You add them up, they're already an 80 billion market in today's world on Ethereum, which is actually a much smaller network. So I think in some ways it's a, it's a more, 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 more conservative estimate that only if 10% of Bitcoin ever, ever becomes productive and programmable, um, you would still have like a north of 100 billion market. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, I think this will be the last question, which is uh, actually, this was a question that uh, Sonny Agarwal of uh, Osmosis hit me up with backstage at your conf your side event at Bitcoin Nashville uh, told me to ask, and I did ask it on stage, but I'll ask you now, because I think this is a really fascinating question and doesn't go away, which is, are, do you see it more likely that Bitcoin will be used in DeFi or is DeFi built on Bitcoin? It's kind of a nuanced question, but but very you know existential, crucial question. It seems like you're kind of in the latter camp, but I, I don't know. What do you, how do you see that evolving? I, I think um, I would say both especially okay. in the short term okay it's both like bitcoin is getting bridged over like a wbdc on ethereum has like a 10 billion circulating right. supply right. so clearly bdc is being used uh also at stacks we've announced uh, uh a partnership with the aptos foundation to bring sbdc to aptos we also i was i was in singapore and announced at the breakpoint at solana that we we're working on bringing sbdc to solana so i think we are we are approaching that world as well but the reality is that the closer you are to Bitcoin itself, the more secure it is, right? So I wouldn't be surprised if Bitcoin gets bridged over everywhere. Coinbase launched their C CBBDC. Kraken is working on their version of it. So I think Bitcoin is going to get packaged up in these wrapped assets and it's going to be everywhere. At the same time, once this usage goes up, this is almost like step two but we are already working on it, that people would want to keep Bitcoin very close to the core, very close to the security of Bitcoin, very close to the safety of Bitcoin and have a more native Bitcoin DeFi economy. And I think that's the part that we are, we are focused on, but we're not ignoring the other part. I think if people want to use Bitcoin on Aptos, we're going to try and help them and enable them to do that and might as well do it through SBDC, our asset, which is a more secure way of using Bitcoin than, than a bridge that's more centralized. Okay. I didn't realize that SBTC would be bridged over to some of these other ecosystems as opposed to just used in the stacks uh, ecosystem. That's super, because that is also, to your point, that's become a super competitive area too. There's all sorts of new, um, you know, competitors to wrap Bitcoin that are, that have been coming out. As you yeah, said. Ab ab absolutely. And I think what we are aiming for is if you look at Coinbase as like the example of a centralized version of using Bitcoin in on, on a L2, uh, they're using it on base mostly. Uh, SBDC is sort of like trying to be the biggest decentralized version, most decentralized, most secure. And I think that's the market that, that we want to play. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
Thank you so much, uh, Munib. Uh, it's great to great to see you, uh, and uh, good luck on everything. Uh, appreciate the update. Thank, thank you so much. It's a, it's a great day to chat with you all for sure. That's it for Markets Daily today. If you like this show, subscribe to the Coindesk Podcast Network that is available on all podcast platforms and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Give us a thumbs up. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.